Hello, we are pleased to provide the video recordings of Florida Digestive Diseases Update held on December 4th and 5th, 2021 in Orlando, Florida. The symposium comprehensively covered several major topics in digestive diseases and was composed of six clinical sessions, 90 minutes each. Each session included four lectures by national faculty and two case presentations. With the resurgence of the Omicron COVID-19 variant across the United States and across the world, there is a high likelihood that our professional colleagues will be unable to attend in-person conferences in the near term. We believe that the symposium recordings will be of significant relevance and value during these difficult times. This is the video recording from Session 1 on burning issues in the esophagus. The first lecture was on the management of GERD, how to manage PPI refractory disease by Dr. John Pandolfino. Second lecture was on esophageal motility disorders, the diagnosis and management, again by Dr. John Pandolfino. Third lecture was on eosinophilic esophagitis, diet, drugs or dilate by Dr. Ikuo Hirano. And the last lecture was on the management of dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, hot, cold or cut by Dr. Sachin Wani. The session is concluded by case presentations and discussion by Dr. Mahendran Jairaj and Dr. Robert Halls. I hope that you enjoy the session. This is a great occasion for us to meet you all. So this is our annual symposium that will, we will be running every December. You're all here not because of us, but because of the quality of the faculty that we brought in. We believe we have the best faculty in the United States uh, to come spend time with us. And I really, really thank them on behalf of the Institute uh, for coming during a very short notice during this time uh, to spend two days with us. But most importantly, we know you all. Uh, we have known you for the last 10 years, all, those, uh, all of you from Florida. So thanks so much for coming and supporting our program. I also want to thank our industry partners uh, for their support of the symposium. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rob uh, to start the symposium. Thank you, Shyam. Um, well, I want to uh, offer my uh, gratitude also to all of you. Uh, it's been a, a long two years uh, of COVID uh, without uh, in-person meetings, and uh, it's just uh, wonderful to, to get to see so many people. Uh, I agree with uh, V. Uh, I think you've come because of our faculty, and um, I, I, I don't think that we could have secured a, a better faculty for this meeting, uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be able to, uh, to introduce them and, and to introduce the meeting. I'm a, a co-chair here with Mahendran Jairaj, who's one of my partners uh, now at Orlando Health. Uh, he'll be running our uh, GI fellowship program, and we'll do a case presentation at the end of this. Our first speaker is uh, John Pandolfino. Um, uh, his official uh, introduction is that the, he's the Hans Popper Professor of Medicine. He's the chief of GI at the uh, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. That's his sort of official uh, sort of introduction, but uh, John is, is one of my um, favorite people. Uh, he's an extraordinary uh, clinician and an extraordinary researcher. He's put together a, an unbelievable faculty uh, at Northwestern uh, and uh, is just one of those people uh, with the energy and enthusiasm uh, that you want to have uh, when you have a meeting. So uh, because he's so good, we've doubled up. Uh, we've asked him to do two different talks uh, during this, uh, this meeting. He's going to uh, begin with GERD, uh, refractory GERD uh, to PPIs, how to manage that. And then his second talk, which he'll do uh, seamlessly go into, will be esophageal motility disorders, the diagnosis and management. So uh, John, welcome, my friend. Welcome. Thank you very much. And I think um, well, I was going to say I'm going to send uh, I'm gonna it's been send, a long time since we've been able to clap, so that's good. I'm going to send Z and, and Bob my, my CV after hearing that presentation in the beginning. So congratulations on the Institute and look forward to your success. Um, so I was given the task of in 30 minutes basically telling you everything that I've learned in my entire career and, and everything that I know. And I'll, I'll do my best and to stay on time. So I have my phone up here just to kind of remind me that I'm going to stay on time here. So one, one topic that I'm going to touch upon that is really um, important to me is this precision or personalized management of GERD and really how to manage these refractory patients. Um, I think GERD is the perfect disease state to lend itself to a precision or personalized approach. And a lot of people think to themselves when I say that, that that's kind of crazy. Um, you know, this is something that's really in oncology and pharmacogenomics. What, what are you talking about, GERD as a precision disease? Well, as you'll see, it's not just a knee-jerk PPI um, prescription. 
There we go. Here are my conflicts of interest as they pertain to GERD treatment and diagnostics, so please keep those in mind. And I just want to start out with a case. We're not going to follow this case. This is just a typical case that I see, a 42-year-old male with heartburn, chest discomfort for six months, originally seen by his primary care doctor, had a uh, stress test, cardiac CT, both were negative. He did note a 15-pound weight gain just because of the pandemic, um, no trouble swallowing, um, no evidence of GI bleed, no other warning signs. He was started on omeprazole, 20 milligrams, mild response, increased to 20 twice a day, about 20% better. Then tried on pantoprazole. For what reason he switched to that? I have no idea, but he was. Um, maybe if he had some side effects, that would be appropriate. To 40 milligrams twice a day, which is actually a lower dose than the omeprazole 20. Um, still no change. Switched to dexlansoprazole and had about a 20% improvement. So, you know, this patient six months later is finally referred to GI, had an endoscopy that was negative, and then eight months later had reflux testing. So this person been being managed for eight months and nobody knows what's going on. So this is really a failure of effective and efficient medicine. So when we think about GERD, um, this definition seems to come up on almost every talk on GERD. And, and the main reason I like it is not the definition, but it really shows the heterogeneity of the presentation, the symptoms, the complications that can occur with GERD. And by looking at this, it's illogical to think that one approach is going to fit all of this, right? I'm not going to treat esophagitis the same as I'm going to treat pulmonary fibrosis. Although if this is reflux related, I'm going to address the reflux. But that being said, it would be illogical. It's not one size or one glove fits all. And this has been kind of the standard algorithm that we, we use. We typically start with, you know, a, assessment, look for warning signs, optimize their PPI therapy. And the one part about this that I think people don't understand is I think people give like 12 week courses of a specific dose of PPI and then follow people up. I actually optimize people's PPI in the first four to six weeks. I don't wait, I change their medicines around and escalate them very quickly. If someone's gonna respond to a PPI, it doesn't take them 12 weeks. It, they respond pretty quickly and you should start seeing a, a benefit. And then of course, you know, pe people are not complying with the meds so you wanna check that. But it really, if you follow these classic algorithms that have been pretty much promoted mostly by primary care, you know, these patients sit there for a very long time before they finally wind up seeing a gastroenterologist who can maybe answer probably the most important question as to whether or not they even have reflux disease. So that's where we get into personalized medicine or precision medicine, P4 medicine. And it's interesting because this definition, although it's got a lot of hype over the last five years, it's really been around forever. This is what Hippocrates was doing. So he was really the first person to practice personalized or precision medicine. He would ask people to get a good history, look for symptoms or signs, and then tailor their therapy. That's what we do in this. So for me, when I see a GERD patient, I don't just ask them about their symptoms, although the type of symptom is very important in how I treat them. I want to know about their response to medicine, their anatomy, their physiology, and also the psychosocial stressors that may be at play. So all of those things come into play when I try to personalize my treatment for the GERD patient. I think one thing that we probably don't do a great job um, documenting um, in our notes and in our DOS reports is the flap valve. And this is something that I'm very focused on in my practice because this matters. So if I'm treating someone and they have a flap valve grade of one, Improving their flap valve is probably not going to help them because if you make something normal, more normal, you might wake it worse, right? But that being said, if it's a two, you know, where you can see some effacement, then these are the patients that I might think about endoscopic therapy if they're refractory. Whereas if they have three or four, I know those per people probably have a defective curl diaphragm and need a hiatal hernia repair most likely if they're truly refractory and having reflux. So that kind of helps me think about what device or what approach or what intervention. And even from that first index endoscopy, I'm already thinking about the opportunities for this patient. Now, in terms of that definition of GERD that you saw last, I like to modify that, and I like to focus it on two specific things when I think about GERD in terms of pathogenesis. Abnormal reflux burden and perception, because people have a mix of that. We've all seen the older person at the VA who presents no symptoms whatsoever, and has LAD esophagitis. And then we see the other person has very minimal reflux, and it's destroying their life. 
they hit that button on that reflux test every time you know they have a reflux event. So they're very hypersensitive and hypervigilant. And then there's some people who have a combination, and I think you have to address this situation by looking at these two components. Now, I'm not going to go through this algorithm, but this is kind of how I go through my initial set, and I'm going to bring the slide up a few times just to talk around it. But you can see that in the end, I can wind up with anything from cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnosis to a surgical procedure. And that's how wide the gamut is in terms of these technologies and these interventions that we may use. So this is how I go through my management process. So now if I saw that person who's a 42-year-old person and they didn't get better on that PPI, I would immediately stop their PPI for at least one to two weeks, do their endoscopy, and do a wireless capsule for 96 hours. And the reason why I like a wireless capsule for 96 hours, not because I'm trying to rule in GERD, but rule out GERD. If they have a negative study, four days negative, they don't have reflux. They don't have non-acid reflux, they don't have reflux. It changes everything I'm going to do for that person. I stop their PPI. I think about an alternative diagnosis, and then potentially even get a manometry if I think this may be an esophageal motor disorder. So that's what happened with that 42-year-old person. They actually wound up having achalasia. So that particular person was being treated for eight months. And we know that people with achalasia can be treated 18 months to two years before that diagnosis is made. And, there, and we know, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen an achalasia patient referred to me who wasn't on a PPI for GERD, and they didn't have GERD. So the first thing I do off the PPI, assess this. And what it also does is it allows me to give a severity um, kind of assessment. So if someone is one day positive out of four, they have mild GERD, especially if it's mostly upright. But if someone is two or more days where their pathologic acid exposure is significant, those people probably need chronic maintenance therapy and probably have bona fide GERD. And these are the people that may have refractory GERD if they continue to have symptoms on PPIs. Now, in those patients, in fact, that particular person that I saw, there are a couple options. Now, you heard me say CBT, but you can use neuromodulators. And neuromodulators are effective. This is a very nice um, slide that I borrowed from Ronnie Foss, where he kind of tailors the neuromodulator. I will tell you that uh, I, I don't do that too often, but what I will do is if I have someone with ineffective esophageal motility, I'm not going to give them a TCA or something with anticholinergic properties because I'll make their peristalsis worse. So in those particular cases, I may use you know, um, an SSRI instead because that will not affect motility. So it might just address the visceral hypersensitivity. So just a nice way to kind of personalize the neuromodulators. But more often, I'm sending these people for cognitive behavioral therapy. These patients are getting sent to one of our psychologists who are training them to shift their attention away from that disease and also using some other techniques like diaphragmatic breathing to help them relax and just shift their attention away from this because what's driving their symptomatology is hypervigilance. So that's really where we get in terms of that particular patient. But what about the patient that does actually have reflux? So they have a positive Bravo one day. I stratify that. If the one day positive is on the first day, I may not consider that a significant test because we know that when people are sedated, they may have a positive test. If the other three days are all negative, I might treat them just as mild reflux disease. But if someone is two or more days positive, those are the patients that I certainly will address and escalate their PPIs and think about maintenance therapy. I would be remiss if I didn't bring this particular topic up for everybody. At Northwestern, we have a certain uh, language that gets sent to every patient on their after-visit summary so that we don't have to go over all of the so-called risks of PPI. But the bottom line is we tell patients PPIs are safe, they're effective, some people have side effects. We don't uh, ever discontinue those because of these risks. We can work around them. And that's basically what we tell patients. But we also tell patients that not everybody gets better with the PPI. And about 50 to 60% of people don't. And this is really where we use these fancier tests like pH impedance and high resolution manometry. pH impedance is a very nice test for assessing why patients with reflux, proven reflux, GERD with esophagitis, LACD, and I actually even believe B, even though that goes against the Lyon consensus, or a positive test off medicine. So if they have proven GERD, and I want to figure out why they're not responding to PPI, I do a pH impedance, I assess their gastric acid secretion and their exposure in the stomach, and then I look at the patterns and mechanisms of reflux. And that's where I actually use high-resolution manometry, too, because you can't do pH impedance without an HRM. 
And during that HRM, and Eco knows this, we do a lot of these at Northwestern, we optimize our ability to personalize this by looking at a postprandial challenge so that I can identify the mechanism and tailor their therapy. Because if they're ruminating, I'm not gonna give them um, a magnetic sphincter augmentation referral. I'm gonna send them for cognitive behavioral therapy, diaphragmatic breathing. Sometimes I'll do that in my office. So getting back to this particular slide, once again, as we move down this, you can see if, if you have a pH impedance test and that pH impedance test is negative, you may have proven GERD, but actually have a functional overlap. And those are patients that, once again, I will refer for cognitive behavioral therapy or gut-directed hypnosis. In terms of the ones that have uncontrolled reflux, these are people that I'm now I've done an HRM and a pH impedance, and they continue to have reflux. This is really where I'm thinking about interventions. So if I'm going to do something like an intervention, like an endoscopic procedure or a surgical procedure, I want them to have proven GERD with proven refractory to PPI. And those are the people who are going to do the best. So what are the potential options here? There's tons of them. Some of these are not FDA approved. They're available in Europe, um, like ESOX and PCABs. But we have a lot of opportunities. So if I see someone with a belching syndrome, um, I may think about giving them baclofen. Um, so if we look at these particular me mechanisms, you know, there's not a lot of great data to support um, promotility agents in uh, reflux disease, but certainly if someone has bad gastroparesis, and, and we do worry about that with people with really bad acid exposure who are refractory to PPIs and taking their medicines, it's not a bad idea to get a gastric emptying study, but I don't use promotility agents unless I'm actually dealing with someone who has concomitant gastroparesis. And as I mentioned, I like baclofen, particularly for belching syndromes and patients who have a large number of acid reflux, um, acid, uh, reflux events or non-acid reflux events that are associated with gas. So if I see that particular pattern and cough. But I don't really like it for heartburn. It doesn't work all that well. So what about the other interventions, like surgery and potentially endoscopic interventions? Well, this was a beautiful study by Stu Speckler where he looked at a randomized trial of medical versus surgical therapy. And even though this was a hard study to recruit for, in the end, he was able to get a publication and he showed what we kind of knew. If you're breaking through PPI and you have real reflux, you're gonna get better with surgery. You're gonna do better with surgery than escalation of medical management. And you can argue that the escalation of medical management in this study wasn't great, but still, nonetheless, you can clearly see that surgery is an appropriate approach for people with refractory reflux disease. Now the problem is, and if you've ever been on a blog about fundoplication, people don't like fundoplication. They're scared of it. There's a lot of complications. And you need to send people to great surgeons. So certainly, there, there are some downsides of fundal plication. And that's really where we start to look for these less invasive procedures, like TIF. And I'll tell you that in the beginning, TIF had a little bit of an issue with durability. But the more and more it's being used, we're seeing that it actually has some durability. The studies out to five and 10 years now show that they can create a partial fundal plication like anatomy or hill flap valve now they can create a two or a one, mostly a one, and these patients can do well for five years. So now we have an endoscopic approach that seems to be working much better. We also have the magnetic sphincter augmentation device, which is also a surgery and does provide an anti-reflux barrier, but the, the real big pro here for me is that it's reversible. So if it doesn't work or the patient is actually having symptoms, you can take it out. Now, I don't wanna make it seem like that's an easy thing to do, but you know, most of the cases that I've seen that had, have had it taken out tend to have normal physiology afterwards and they do quite well. So I like this because it doesn't burn a bridge. Because we know that if you fail your first fundal application, the likelihood of getting better on the second fundal application and a third fundal application is very low. So this obviously allows you to try something a little bit less invasive. So in the end, this is really my, my model for GERD and my conceptual model for GERD. I, I like to call it my psychophysiologic model for reflux disease and a precision approach. I spend a lot of my time focused on the abnormal reflux, but just as much time dealing with the hypervigilance and the autonomic arousal. And what I found in my practice, I'm a plumber at trade. If I only treat the plumbing, I don't make people better because people still worry. They worry about cancer. They worry about choking. And you have to deal with these psychosocial stressors. And if you can do that, you will optimize the treatment and give the patient a personalized approach that will be both effective and efficient. Thank you very much. All right, I guess I'll introduce my next talk.
So I'm going to shift gears and pivot um, and focus on motility testing and diagnosing motility disorders and just kind of go through how I do this once again in sort of a precision approach, but I'm going to introduce a new technology. Now, the one thing I will tell you that I do have a significant conflict of interest with the FLIP device. Um, we actually have a licensing agreement um, and a patent application, actually a patent um, uh, with uh, Medtronic that is shared for this particular device that I will talk a lot about. So once again, when I see patients in clinic with heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia, chest pain, and food impaction, there's, also, there's always this knee-jerk reflex of doing things empirically and just following the patient. But remember, you know, these patients can suffer for years without getting a definitive diagnosis, and that's not effective. That's not value-based healthcare. Being value-based doesn't mean that you take two years to get a diagnosis of achalasia because you're worried about spending a little bit of money getting a manometer. So in my practice, though, I will tell you that when I see these patients with the, these esophageal symptoms, I can pretend I know what I'm doing in front of my medical students, but a lot of times I'm wrong. Like the differential diagnosis for those symptoms could be GERD, EOE, obstruction, motor disorder, functional. So in that, I, I have some solace in that I know that I'm going to do an endoscopy in this person. So no matter what, when people come in with these symptoms and they're not getting better, especially if, even after two to four weeks of PPI, I'm going to do an endoscopy. And endoscopy is still the most important test that we have in esophagology, contrary to what many of you may think I think about um, the diagnostic testing. Although I love manometry and I love FLIP, endoscopy is still extremely important. And when you do your endoscopy, you're obviously looking for an inflammatory condition, whether it's reflux or dermatologic um, esophagitis, um, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, which you'll hear Eco talk about. And then, of course, hernia. Hernia is something people ignore. If someone has a three centimeter hernia and they have dysphagia, it's probably from the hernia. I don't know how many times people have sent people to me and they're like, I don't know what's going on with this person's dysphagia. I'm like, they've got a four centimeter hernia. Their esophagus is not working. They're not emptying very well. That's not normal, you know? And now, do you have to fix that? I think I talked most people through that so that they don't have to need a surgery, but for the most part, that's still significant. But what do we typically do then? They have a negative endoscopy, we walk and tell the patient we have no idea what's going on, they're, they're upset with us, right? I mean, I hate walking in there and saying, okay, I'm sorry, everything was normal, I don't do that anymore. I go, good news, you don't have cancer, all right? And they're like, oh, okay, great. I'm like, but I have no idea what's going on. So I'm gonna have to send you for this horrible test where I put a catheter down your nose, and then they love me, they come back scowling and when they see me in clinic. But I always tell them I've had that eight times for research studies, and I know it's not pleasant, but it does help us with this particular construct. So this is the new Chicago classification. I'm not gonna go through it, I only have 15 minutes, but the bottom line is, it's a change because now the protocol's a lot more elaborate, we can do upright supine, and the great thing about it now, at least in 4.0, is that we, we don't relegate you to only using manometry. We say that you can use complementary testing and you should use complementary testing to help you make these diagnoses. So if you have a diagnosis of EGG outflow obstruction, it's never a conclusive diagnosis. It has to be confirmed with either an esophagram or flip. And I will tell you that although I was basically creator of all of those metrics that you see that we use during high resolution manometry, I don't use them. Because a picture's worth a thousand measurements and a thousand tracings. These patterns are really where the money is. When you see these patterns, you know what's going on. I don't know, I don't care what the IRP is. If the IRP is 15, 17, 18, I really don't care. That doesn't matter to me. It's those patterns, because those patterns are showing me what the biomechanics are in the esophagus in terms of emptying, and will probably relate more to the symptoms than any one of those measurements. I don't know how many times I've seen someone with a distal latency of 4.3, and everyone's, oh, this is spasm. Nope, it's normal. Because you look at the patterns, and you see normal peristalsis, and you see normal emptying. So remember, these to topographic patterns are really the beauty of high-resolution manometry. So now, where does FLIP come into play? Well, FLIP's actually a device that I've been working with for probably 20 years, even though most people only recognize it now over the last few years. It originally started with the Barostat, and Eco remembers me when I was a fellow making these bags in my lab and putting them together with, a, with uh, sandwich bags and melting them, and then creating this. Then I created the Hydrostat, and Northwestern filed a patent for that. And, and that was actually used in breast augmentation surgery to look for tension in the breast implants uh, site and for suture um, dehiscence. And really didn't go anywhere because they realized that they didn't really need it. So it kind of got tabled for a while. And then this functional lumen imaging probe device was developed, and it really overlapped with the Hydrostat. And I started working with that particular company. 
And really the beauty of this was I actually stole something from someone named Ray Klaus, who is really the real godfather of high resolution manometry. And what he did with manometry, he took those tracings, pressure tracings, and converted them color, and then created those beautiful color topography plots that really are the foundation of high resolution manometry. Well, I stole from Ray. I took the diameter tracings, I converted them to color, and made the same type of topography plots. So now with Flip, I can do basically the same thing that you can with manometry, but the difference is instead of assessing primary peristalsis, I'm assessing secondary peristalsis. I'm giving the esophagus a stress test where it has to react to distension. And these are the patterns that you see. And what we were also able to do is show that it was actually a better measure of EGJ obstruction than IRP, manometry, and esophagram. And in fact, if you look at this particular, um, this is a, 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 what we call a K-nearest neighbor plot, but if you look at this and you combine the DI and the maximal diameter, you have great sensitivity and specificity and negative predictive value and positive predictive value for normal and abnormal. In fact, I can pretty much say that if your diameter is over 16 and your DI is greater than two, you have normal opening. I don't care what your IRP is. Your IRP can be 50. It doesn't matter, that's wrong. So that's how effective this device is. So where does this play? Well, if you think about our patient that we scope and we go through their endoscopy and we're looking at these anatomical things, now during that index endoscopy, I could drop the flip, I can tell the patient if they have normal manometry or they're gonna have a normal manometry or they're gonna have achalasia. I can give them a definitive diagnosis and start their treatment plan right away. If it's a normal pattern, I, give, I put a Bravo in, check their 96 hour pH. If they don't have reflux, I send them for cognitive behavioral therapy. Happens in a week as opposed to eight months. So really this is where we are in terms of this. And once again, I use a precision approach. The, the crux of this is really going through this algorithm, looking at whether or not they have an obstruction at the EGJ and what the patterns are, just like high resolution manometry in the Chicago classification. So if they have an obstruction and they have absent contractility, that's consistent with achalasia. If they have normal opening at the EGJ and they have a rack pattern, that is normal manometry. They're gonna have a normal manometry. And those are the people I can be confident that I can tell them they don't need that horrible test with a catheter down their nose. And I will go through that and based on what those patterns are, that's how I'll treat them. Whether I think they have a spastic disorder or potentially another motor disorder. And this is what it looks like. If you look at the high resolution manometry patterns on top and the flip topography patterns on the bottom, that's how they look and they look very similar. So by just looking at these images, I can make that diagnosis. So where does this really help? Well, I think it doesn't really help all that much in the achalasia subtypes just yet, but it, we are coming up with more novel machine learning techniques that is gonna help us be a little bit more precise with the approach to achalasia. I will tell you that I do think that the achalasia subtypes do matter when we treat these patients. And when we see these particular patients, the way I kind of go through this algorithm here, it's very simple. If they have an EGJ outflow obstruction, I have to get an esophagram or a flip. I have to document what's wrong. And if it's positive, then I treat them as if they have achalasia and evolution. If they don't have a positive esophagram or a positive flip, these are people I just watch and manage conservatively. If they have type three achalasia, I'm gonna do a poem that's tailored. And achalasia type one or two, they can pretty much get anything that you wanna give them. So when I actually look at this though, I wanna keep in mind that there are some factors that should affect our precision approach to achalasia. Anatomy, whether they have a hernia or dilatation, their motor pattern and obesity. And the other thing that's important is people are not doing as well as we think they are. Six months a year, they may be, yeah, about 85, 90% better, but then at two years or three years, they've been developing these bombs, these blown out myotomies, and we have to be very careful with that. And I think there's some things that we can do to prevent that. So how I approach these patients is if they have a type three pattern, I'm not doing pneumatic dilation, doesn't really work for these patients, I do a tailored poem. If they have an EGG outflow obstruction that's conclusive, I do a pneumatic dilation or a limited poem to their LES. And when I say I do it, I'm not doing it. Aziz Adam or Eric Hungness are doing it. If they have a hernia, these are people that I will not do a poem on because they will have horrible reflux afterwards. These are people getting a heller myotomy with a door. If they have severe dilatation, PD is really not very effective. I usually send these people for a heller myotomy with a door, especially if there's significant sink trapping because they can sometimes ameliorate that anatomical issue. If they have obesity without a hernia, PD with a hernia, I consider bariatric procedures combined with a definitive approach. I never do a TIF with POEM because most people don't need PPIs or have reflux afterwards. 
but certainly we have done them after people who've developed reflux after poem. In terms of heterogeneous, these next few slides are going to go very fast. We, don't, we have no idea what we're doing with jackhammer, to be quite honest. Um, I think that 80 to 90% of these people are normal, so you have to be very careful. The patterns are very heterogeneous, and some of these are just related to a small hernia, of these patterns. So when I see these patients, I'm methodically going through them and thinking about the disturbance, how severe it is, and what may be causing this. Is this a secondary response? The esophagus is not smart, but if you block it, it tries to push things hard, just like the left ventricle when you have aortic stenosis. And eventually, it will dilate to compensate for that obstruction. So you have to be careful. Are you catching it in that early phase? So this is a busy slide. One thing I want you to remember, if you see someone with hypercontractile esophagus, rule out obstruction. Because if they have an obstruction, you fix that obstruction, they will get better. Now, if they don't have an obstruction, I typically do an SMR trial, smooth muscle relaxant trial. I used to do Levsin, Isodil, calcium channel blockers, and then finally sildenafil. And then I realized I was doing exactly what I did to that first patient in that first case, the 42-year-old. So now I just give people sildenafil right off the bat, see if they get better, bring them back in, restudy them. And really, that's the thing. You want to see a correlation between symptom improvement and motility findings before you send these people for a poem. And last but not least, ineffective esophageal motility has gotten a bad rap over the years, but it does have value. If you see this and it's really severe, these people can have bad clearance. And these are actually great patients for hypnosis and neuromodulators, specifically SSRIs. So in the end, the Chicago classification is not perfect. Achalasia, though, I think, you know, is pretty good, the subtyping, and it does allow us to provide a precision approach. EGJ outflow obstruction should never be diagnosed with manometry alone. That is most likely an artifact, and you change, even when you change positions. So always use FLIP and TBE to confirm that diagnosis before you do a definitive therapy. Jackhammer is heterogeneous. Chicago 4.0 did nothing to help us with that. We need to do a lot more work on that particular disorder. But remember, I think most of these people are normal. They just have a normal response to either a different at anatomy at the EGJ, but there are these very small groups that may have a spastic motor disorder that you can tease out if you give them a smooth muscle relaxant and you look at the effect and their motility changes. Weak peristalsis is still a borderline motor disorder, but don't forget about it. It does have impact on your patient's care, especially in reflux. And the other thing is there are other patterns beyond what we see during Chicago that happen in between the swallows when you change positions that actually may help you decide what's going on with that particular patient. And last but not least, and I think I caught us almost up a little bit, CBT and hypnosis are effective treatments for everything in the esophagus. So if you don't have access to a psychologist, go to, go to um, what they call psychopath or, or psych path now. I like to call it psychopath, but it's psych path. <laughs> um, but it's a network of these providers that can provide um, interventions virtually across state lines, and it's legal. So it's PSYPAC, not psychopath. They get very mad when I say that. <laughs> but, but anyway, with that, thank you very much for indulging me and, and coming in person today to see my two talks. Thank you. It's really uh, brilliant, uh, John. Thank you so much. We're going to have a case presentation uh, or two or as many as we can have uh, at the end of this. And the cases will bring out some of the concepts that uh, – that have been presented during the talks, and that's the time where uh, we'll take some questions uh, rather than taking questions now, if that's okay. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Iko Hirano. Um, again, uh, just a, a wonderful friend and, and somebody who I tremendously respect. Uh, he's a professor of medicine uh, in uh, John's department at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. Um, he's, he's known around the world for eosinophilic esophagitis, but if you narrow him down to just that area, you've really uh, not done him a, a, a service. Uh, he's a really a, a, a brilliant guy. He's a, a very thoughtful individual, uh, goes about things very uh, precisely and, and carefully. And um, also, I, I fundamentally changed my dilation technique uh, after attending um, the course at Northwestern and watching uh, Iku do um, dilations on a, on a, a, a eosinophilic esophagitis patient. So he's had a, a significant impact on, on my practice because I do a fair amount of, uh, of dilations for complex strictures. So uh, Iku, it's uh, great to have you. Uh, we're going to ask you to talk about your 
maybe your favorite subject, which is eosinophilic esophagitis. So thank welcome, so my much. friend. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> It, it certainly has become my favorite uh, disease and diagnosis, um, and I want to thank Dr. Haas, uh, Shyam, and the entire Orlando Health Digestive Group and the organization uh, here. This is a tremendously organized meeting, and there's so much hospitality here, so thank you so much. So I'll be talking about eosinophilic esophagitis. My disclosures are listed here. I will mention that I'm going to be discussing off-label use of medications. Currently, there are no medications yet approved by the FDA for treatment of EOE. So to cover this topic over the next 15 minutes, there's four questions I'll try to address. First, we'll look at what's new with the available medical therapeutics and what you're doing in your own clinical practices. Are there any updates there? Secondly, uh, ask the question, is less actually more when you're managing EOE patients with diet therapy? Third, how will advanced therapeutics change our management in the not too distant future? And finally, ask the question, somewhat controversial, can medical therapy actually reverse esophageal strictures? So first, thinking about our current management strategies, these are these things that we have in our current uh, cl clinical armamentarium for EOE. We have the three Ds, drugs, diet, and dilation, and I'll touch on each of these therapeutic areas. First, for drugs, PPI therapy. <clears throat> As you all know, PPIs are no longer required for the diagnosis of EOE back uh, before 2018. You had to do that two-month trial of high-dose PPI before you can make a diagnosis. That criteria has been removed now in 2018 so you can make a diagnosis without the PPI. Secondly, uh, PPIs are now viewed as a first-line therapeutic option. This was reviewed in the 2020 AGA Joint Task Force on Allergy Immunology Clinical Guidelines on EOE Management, and they rated the overall effectiveness of PPI therapy to be 42% when you're looking at therapeutic responses being a histologic response, getting that EO count to under 15 EOs prior power field, so about 42%. The effectiveness, widespread availability, ease of administration, and safety position PPIs as a popular first-line therapeutic option. And in my own practice, it's what I start most of my patients with EOE on before I go on, go on to steroids or dietary therapy. Most studies that use PPI therapy when they've looked at this have used either a double dose once a day or single dose twice daily. And there have been several reports now of loss of histologic response with prolonged use of PPI, but that's happening in a, in a small minority of patients. So for the most part, these are effective therapies, and they continue to provide effective relief in the maintenance phase. For swallowed topical corticosteroids in EOE, uh, there have now been over a dozen placebo-controlled, randomized-controlled trials that have demonstrated histologic and symptom benefits for both children and adults with EOE. The data is quite convincing. In fact, in the 2020 AGA JTF guideline, this was the only therapeutic class that got a strong recommendation. Everything else was given a conditional recommendation to use, or in some cases, not to use as other therapeutics. The overall histologic response is 65%, so greater than what you see with PPI therapy, which again was 42%. There has been a trial. Many people ask, well, is fluticasone better than budesonide? Budesonide right now given as a liquid, and fluticasone given by the meter dose inhaler. This is a study done by Dr. Evan Dellen. He actually randomized patients to those two therapeutic arms. And he, when you kept the dose comparable, about a milligram twice a day, the, the, the two steroids behaved about the same. So you don't have to think one is a better delivery system than the other. In terms of side effect, the biggest side effect that's been reported has been candidiasis. It could be oral, pharyngeal, or esophageal. But fortunately, it's relatively uncommon, generally less than 10%. And I'll say the vast majority, way over 90% of the patients that I see with this don't even know they have it until I put the scope down and I see a few white plaques in the esophagus. So symptoms are relatively uncommon. And this can respond, obviously, to an antifungal or just dropping the dose down on the steroid for the most part. In terms of long-term safety, there are concerns that we have about giving these steroids um, uh, through this mode of administration. And these are all being carefully looked at in prospective studies. In the clinical trials now that are being done by pharma, all these side effects are being carefully tracked, adrenal insufficiency, growth suppression in children, bone density, cataracts, all these things are being tracked. There really are no significant safety signals to date. There have been reports retrospectively of adrenal suppression, biochemical, not clinical adrenal suppression, but biochemical. You see a drop in the AM cortisol. Um, but this has mostly been seen in patients who are taking steroids multiple different ways. They're taking inhaled steroids for asthma, swallowed steroids for EOE, and intranasal steroids for uh, allergic rhinitis at the same time. In terms of regulatory approval, Europe is ahead of the US. Uh, they have had uh, approved tablet formulation of budesonide since January 2018, approved by their regulatory EMA. 
In the U.S., uh, we're a little bit behind, but we have completed two phase three clinical trials. I'll show you data on one trial using a liquid budesonide, and there has been a completed recently a phase three trial of fluticasone oral disintegrating tablet that hopefully will be uh, going to the FDA soon. The best data we have right now in the U.S., this is phase three trial of budesonide oral suspension. Liquid pr preparation is given twice a day. Um, this is the largest phase three trial ever conducted for eosinophilic esophagitis, a whopping 318 patients. I know that doesn't sound like a lot compared to the IBD trials, but it's a lot for EOE that was considered a rare disease before. And these 318 adults were randomized two to one to budesonide versus placebo for 12 weeks. Budesonide here dosed at two milligrams twice a day. So that is twice what you're using in your clinical practice, where people are typically using one milligram twice daily. Uh, these were, again, adolescents and adults. Uh, the primary endpoints that have now been uh, laid forth by the FDA is that you have to show not just histologic benefit, you're not just trying to get the eosinophil countdown, but you have to show some symptom benefit to the patient using a PRO. So this was the first trial to use a validated PRO to measure this and used histology as well for the co-primary endpoints and the trial met its primary endpoints. On the left-hand side, you're seeing the histologic efficacy being defined by a very stringent threshold of less than or equal to six EOs per power field, so much less than the diagnostic threshold of 15, getting the EOs to under six eosinophils, achieved in 53% with BOS compared to 1% with placebo, and dysphagia, again, measured for the first time in any trial, uh, any phase three trial ever conducted using a validated PRO, 30% uh, reduction in a DSQ, which is a daily symptom questionnaire. Dysphagia improved significantly with budesonide compared to placebo. Now, you'll notice that wasn't as great a margin with symptoms, and that's because there's a large placebo response. And that surprised me, actually. When I saw this across trials now, we're seeing that across all the UA trials, is that dysphagia, and these are patients with highly symptomatic dysphagia twice a week or more, they did get better with the placebo, which was actually I was quite surprised about. Now, let's move on to dietary therapy. Uh, is there uh, is less more? What do I mean by that? So when we look at dietary therapy for EOE, there are three different classes of diet therapy. There's the formula diet. That's the elemental diet. That's getting rid of all your dietary protein, giving you only amino acids. There's the empirical elimination diet. The most popular has been the SFED, or six-food elimination diet. And then there's allergy testing directed diets, where you send the patient to the allergist, they do some skin tests, maybe some blood tests, and they tell you what to avoid. All three diet therapy therapies were given a conditional recommendation in the AGA JTF guideline. But if you look at the quality of evidence that informed those recommendations, they did vary. The strongest evidence was for elemental, but we hardly ever use elemental because it's not palatable for most people to do it long term. And the lowest quality evidence came from the allergy testing directed diet approach. The other part of your decision about using dietary therapy is when you look at the effectiveness of the different diet strategies. So what you're seeing here is the effectiveness starting at the top for elemental diet, then going from top to bottom, elimination diets, empirical elimination diets, starting with a six food, then a four food, two food, and a single food, getting rid of only milk, which is the most common food allergen for EOE around the world. And you'll see at the very bottom is also allergy testing directed diets in terms of the effectiveness. So clearly, the most effective therapy is the formula diet, but that's the one with which, which almost nobody uses in clinical practice because it's really not feasible long term. It's a great proof of concept, but not very practical. And then you have what we use generally, which is the empirical elimination diet. And that's you know a good example why we don't do allergy testing direct diets because they're really no, they're not that accurate. And, um, and they really have very poor quality evidence to support their use. Now, if you look at this, you would say that uh, the more foods you get rid of, the more likely your response should be. It kind of makes sense. The more food allergens you remove, the more likely the patient will get better. Well, this was examined for the first time in the first randomized trial ever conducted for dietary therapy in eosinophilic esophagitis. This was presented at DDW this past May. Full publication has not been done yet. The trial was called SOFEED which stands for six versus one food elimination diet for eosinophilic esophagitis. And a SOFIED study basically randomized patients to the traditional S-fed or milk alone elimination. And the study was designed and expected and powered to show that six food elimination diet would blow away the single food elimination diet. Makes sense, more foods, you should get a better response. But 129 adult patients randomized, this is why we do uh, clinical medicine and why we do trials, basically no difference. Histologic endpoints identical between six food versus single food elimination diet. 
Symptom improvement, marginally better for six food versus one food, but almost very comparable. And an endoscopic improvement using a validated endoscopic soaring tool, EREFs, basically did not differ between single food and six food elimination diet. So I think this is, uh, this is generating a lot of discussion and, and questions. Why was the response, which was only 40% for six food elimination diet here, why was it so low compared to what's been published already? It's generating a lot of questions about the trial and, 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 and some of the compliance things that went on with the patients. But needless to say, I think it does highlight the fact that less diet, less um, elimination of diets, uh, one food or two food, might be a good way to start your patients and get more acceptance from your patients and certainly require less endoscopy. Because uh, if you do a six food diet, you're talking about seven more endoscopies. Now, what about advanced therapeutics? And these are actually right on the um, frontier right now. We'll probably see something, I would say, within the next year or two in our armamentarium to using advanced therapeutics to manage eosinophilic esophagitis. And I want to highlight just two trials. Uh, these are the phase two and three clinical trials that have been published. One is using an agent called sindacamab. You might not have heard of this. Um, it's not commercially available for any indication right now. It used to be called RPC4046. And it's a monoclonal antibody directed against IL-13. It actually inhibits IL-13 from binding to both alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors. Now, as a biologic, it's administered subcutaneously. This is data from the phase two clinical trial that was published. Uh, patients, uh, 99 adult patients randomized to sindacamab two different doses, a low dose or high dose, or placebo. For this phase two clinical trial, the primary endpoint was histologic. And you can see on the left-hand side with placebo in gray, basically no change with placebo. It's one of the nice things about working in EOE using Histology is a biomarker. There's very minimal to no placebo response. But with both low-dose and high-dose sindacamab, significant and robust reduction in tissue eosinophilia. The esophageal eosinophils dropped quite dramatically. 50% got to under 15 eosinophils per high power field. In the right-hand side, you're seeing the objective measures of endoscopic healing. That's the edema, rings, exudate, furrows, and stricture formation. Again, marginal change, which was not significant with placebo, but more robust, significant changes with both low-dose and high-dose syndacamab. The second agent I want to highlight is called dupilumab, which is a monoclonal antibody directed against the IL-4 receptor alpha. And this has been FDA approved. It's been FDA approved for a number of atopic type 2 inflammatory conditions that include moderate to severe asthma, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and chronic rhinocytositis with nasal polyps, also known to many of us as, as allergic rhinitis with the polyps. And this approval, but it's not been approved for eosinophilic esophagitis. So it was studied initially in a phase two uh, randomized placebo control trial in a, four, a small number, 47 adult patients who were randomized to 12 weeks of dupilumab compared to placebo, one-to-one -one randomization. For this phase two clinical trial, the primary endpoint was symptom-based, showing symptoms that dysphagia would improve, and the study met its primary endpoint, showing symptom reduction with dupilumab compared to placebo in just 12 weeks of therapy. Other key secondary endpoints for this phase two clinical trial were, of course, histopathology. And in fact, in this trial, 80% of the patients who got on dupilumab had a reduction in their eosinophil counts below 15 eosinophils prior power field. So significant and robust tissue healing with dupilumab. And finally, on the far right, the endoscopic uh, using EREFs, significant improvement in endoscopic features of activity with dupilumab compared to placebo. The success of dupilumab in the phase two clinical trial led to a phase three clinical trial, which was just presented at ACG last year and then again at UGW um, this year. And here, uh, the study is using the co-primary endpoint. Remember how the FDA is now asking for not just uh, histologic healing, not just symptoms, but a co-primary. You have to show that you win on both areas. And dupilumab did that. Uh, here, 81 adult patients and adolescents randomized now for 24 weeks, not 12 weeks, like in the phase two trial, so double the duration of therapy. Co-prime endpoints were met. Histologic response, less than or equal to six eosinophils, pi power field. 59.5% with dupilumab, 5% with placebo. Symptom response, this time measured using a validated PRO, showing significant and robust improvement in dysphagia with dupilumab compared to placebo. The other aspect that's been looked at now with these uh, more advanced therapeutics, biologics, and small molecules is what does it do to the transcriptome? There's a unique transcriptome in the esophagus. This is looking at upregulated and red and downregulated genes in the esophagus. 
based on biopsies, and you can look at hundreds of genes that are expressed within the esophagus uh, in controls in EOE patients, and there's a very distinct fingerprint for eosinophilic esophagitis as depicted on these baseline slides. Well, this was done in the phase two clinical trial of dupilumab, mapping out the heat maps of the upregulated and downregulated genes, and as you would expect with placebo, no change in the expression of RNA signatures. However, with dupilumab, the, the, uh, the patients went from red to blue. They basically all normalized their esophageal transcriptome in response to biologic therapy. Now, the advantage of this approach is similar to what Dr. Pandolfino was saying. This may allow us to use more a personalized or precision medicine, where we now can target patients who have a specific biomarker profile. So these are high type 2 inflammatory patients that will respond to a specific biologic agent. So we may be able to do that in the not too distant future. Just to uh, close out this particular section on therapeutics, advanced therapeutics, this is a list now. Uh, it's quite impressive that just in the past 10 years, we now have a list of at least six agents that are in phase two and phase three clinical trials for eosinophilic esophagitis and also now for eosinophilic gastritis and eosinophilic enteritis. And this is just a listing of some of the molecules that are, on the, um, that are in trials right now. So why would you ever consider biologic therapy? Well, we've got all these other great treatments like steroids, and we've got uh, diet therapy and PPIs. Well, the fact is there are steroid refractory patients, and we're seeing that in our clinical trials now, where sometimes 20, 30 percent of patients do not respond to swallow topical corticosteroids, so they would be good candidates for an alternative. Not everybody wants to do diet. You could avoid potential long-term adverse effects of steroids, although these steroid effects are relatively minimal. There's a concept, it's a, it's a conceptual advantage that we're targeting not just globally using a steroid, but we're using specific targeted uh, therapies that are directed against allergic pathways. And the other major advantage, which I think really hasn't been talked about much, is that we can now deliver systemic therapy that can address multiple atopic diseases. Remember that 70 to 80 percent of your EOE patients have not just EOE, they've got allergic rhinitis, they're taking their nasal steroids, they've got asthma atopic dermatitis, in some cases, IgE-mediated food allergy. So you could address all these types of at atopic diseases with one treatment. And potential benefits, potentially for remodeling of the esophagus. And I'll come back to that in, in the, my very last slide. So the last question I want to address is just, can medical therapy actually reverse esophageal strictures? Now, dilation is probably what we all do. We see an EOE patient, they've got a stricture. I'd say most gastroenterologists do a dilation. It's the first therapy that was ever described for managing adults with EOE, and we still do it today. A little bit of hesitation because of early reports of complications, but we've now looked at the systematically, systematic reviews conducted by the AGA and many other organizations have shown that dilation is extremely safe. It's very effective. It can heal. It can basically make patients feel better about 90% of the time. Their dysphagia will improve with an effective dilation. Low rates of complications, perforation rates here, hospitalization, bleeding, all rates that are very low, and approximating that for all benign stricture dilation. The one exception there might be hospitalization, typically for you know, EGJ strictures and Shasky ring and, and uh, peptic strictures. We don't usually hospitalize those patients with that degree, but that's because these patients have long strictures. They often get more severe pain, uh, fear of swallowing or dinophagia after an effective dilation. Now, the question, can medical therapy actually do anything about that um, to uh, reduce our need for dilation? This is a, 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 actually a physician in Chicago that I saw back in 2006, and he had really bad dysphagia. That's his endoscopy, and that's his barium esophagram. Narrow caliber esophagus, six millimeters in diameter, couldn't get a scope through there. And I started him on fluticasone, and I didn't hear from him. And I was looking through my list one day and said, whatever happened to that guy? I called him up. He said, oh, I'm great. I'm still taking my fluticasone, no problems. And I, he, never, he, had never, he hadn't followed up. So I brought him back. I did an endoscopy. And on the endoscopy, you can see some very subtle rings, but it virtually looks normal. And the barium esophagram, virtually normal. So he had normalized his esophagus with medical therapy. And that was a kind of wake-up call that these medical therapeutics may be effective at treating these patients without doing a lot of dilation. So this has been studied now. This is a study done by Dr. Carlson in our group. He used FLIP that John, John actually wisely, uh, nicely w went through uh, to look at esophageal uh, physical characteristics, the distensibility of the esophagus. This is FLIP topographic mapping of a patient before therapy. Um, you can see the lot of red. Red is bad on topography. It means low diameters. The diameter here is seven millimeters or less in the esophagus. And this is baseline. After treatment with butesonide, no dilation, just medical therapy, almost a doubling of his esophageal diameter, the red going to yellow, almost a doubling of diameter. Impressive result. 
Now, this is the uh, <clears throat> study that Dr. Carlson did looking at 18 adult patients with EOE treated only with medical or dietary therapy. PPI, diet therapy, or steroids were given. And after follow-up, dramatic improvement, statistically significant improvement in the south field distensibility. Now, you'll note not every patient normalized. There are some patients there at the bottom, the 11 millimeter, 12 millimeter, didn't actually get better. Not every patient gets better, but a significant proportion of patients got better. 40% had an improvement in diameter by two millimeters or greater, and that's what we're doing with dilation. So you can get effective relief of strictures with eosinophilic esophagitis. And this was now proven in the phase two clinical trial I showed you for dupilumab. Uh, this is the same study I showed you before, the small phase two trial for dupilumab versus placebo. Distensibility was measured using FLIP with measurements at baseline and after 12 weeks of dupilumab, showing statistically significant improvement in esophageal distensibility. The improvement here was about three millimeters. Again, what we're doing with dilation. So, so to summarize the talk here, uh, first point, swallow topical corticosteroids are highly efficacious and formulations that are optimized for esophageal delivery will improve our management. Secondly, milk elimination is an effective diet strategy and one that I'm starting to use more and more in my clinical practice rather than starting with a six food elimination diet. Advanced therapeutics appear quite promising and offer the potential advantages of both a systemic delivery and targeted approach. And finally, esophageal strictures may improve with medical or dietary therapy without dilation and reduce the need for dilation, at least in some proportion of patients. Uh, with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Iko. So now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Sachin Wani. Um, I think he's, he's too young to be a professor of medicine, but uh, nevertheless, uh, he is at the uh, University of Colorado uh, Auschwitz uh, School of Medicine. Uh, he's uh, the director of their Center for uh, Esophageal and, and Gastric uh, uh, Treatment. Um, and uh, we've asked him to talk about Barrett's esophagus, uh, but I, uh, I have to mention that I think that uh, actually Sachin, um, his, his greatest impact, at least in my estimation uh, to date, is his uh, systematic study of uh, endoscopic uh, training. Uh, and he's really, I, I think, at, at, the, at the top of the list of people who have really systematically, objectively looked at training uh, in endoscopy. And, and that will be an impact uh, that I think he will have for a, a long, long time. So Sachin, it's uh, great to have you. Thank you for coming. And uh, tell us about Barrett's esophagus. Thank you so much, Rob, for that invitation and that introduction. Thank you. I do want to thank Sham, Uday, G, and you, Rob, for this uh, invitation, and it's an absolute honor to be speaking to you today. These are my disclosures, and here's what I hope to cover in the next 15 minutes. I do want to take a couple of minutes talking to you about the importance of a high-quality endoscopic examination, recognize that that is the first step to actually identify patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia that would merit endoscopic eradication therapy. I will introduce these terms, post-endoscopy esophageal neoplasia and post-endoscopy esophageal cancer, talk to you about the principles that guide endoscopic eradication therapy in patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia, what's the optimal management of patients with Barrett's-related low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and mucosal cancer, try and answer this fundamental question, how effective are our therapies, how durable is this approach? talk a little bit about the management of patients who have achieved complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia, and everything that I say will be placed in the context of recently published guidelines and quality indicator documents. So let's talk a little bit about the basics and the epidemiology. I think everyone in the room recognizes that Barrett's esophagus is a remarkably common condition. About 5% of the adult U.S. population has this diagnosis. It's the only identifiable pre-malignant condition for esophageal adenocarcinoma, a cancer that continues to increase in incidence as demonstrated in our most recent analysis using the SEER database. So clearly efforts are to be made if we are to have any impact on the incidence, morbidity, and mortality associated with this lethal cancer. 
Now, the overarching goal of our screening and surveillance practices is to really identify patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia so that we can perform endoscopic eradication therapy, reduce the risk of progression to invasive cancer, and avoid the morbidity and mortality associated with this cancer. Unfortunate reality is that we actually miss lesions within the Barrett segment, and this is consistent with the concept of missing lesions during colonoscopy. And to address this limitation of our screening and surveillance practices, we introduced this term post-endoscopy esophageal neoplasia and post-endoscopy esophageal adenocarcinoma, analogous to the concept of post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer. You Using an evidence-based approach and a consensus-based approach with an international panel, we defined peen or post-endoscopy esophageal neoplasia as cancer or high-grade dysplasia detected before the next recommended surveillance endoscopy in a patient diagnosed with non-dysplastic Barrett's at the index endoscopy. Peak uses cancer as the endpoint. So a logical question at this point is, how common is peak and peen in our clinical practice? Using a claims-based data, the Optum database, we showed that nearly 14% of all cancers can actually be can classified as missed cancers or peak. We did a systematic review and meta-analysis using observational data and demonstrated that nearly 21% to 27% of all high-grade dysplasias or cancers can be classified as peak or peen, depending on the definition that you're using. So I've hopefully convinced you that this is a common entity, an entity that we need to pay close attention to in our clinical practice. Our goal, again, is to identify these visible lesions within the Barrett segment so that we can perform endoscopic eradication therapy. What are some of the things that we, as a community of endoscopists, can do in our practice to reduce the rate of peak and peen? Some of the things that I suggest include the following. Really a meticulous examination documenting the landmarks of the distal esophagus, spending adequate time inspecting the Barrett segment, using high-definition white light endoscopy and virtual chromoendoscopy, the use of standardized grading systems such as the PROG classification system to define the length of the Barrett segment, and the Paris classification to define any visible lesion that you might see within the Barrett segment. Only after you've accomplished all of these should you take out your biopsy forcep and obtain biopsies using the Seattle Biopsy Protocol. Several of the recommendations that I will be talking to you about have been highlighted in this guideline document published by the ASGE and the Standards of Practice Committee. So what are the principles that guide endoscopic eradication therapy in patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia? Now, when you have a lesion that actually breaches the muscularis mucosa and extends into the submucosa, that patient should actually be referred to your surgical colleagues for an esophagectomy, given the high risk of lymph node metastases. On the other hand, any patient with a lesion above the muscularis mucosa, these are patients with high-grade dysplasia, mucosal cancer, and certain patients with confirmed low-grade dysplasia, these are ideal candidates for endoscopic eradication therapy. If you can play the video, please. So the first thing you really want to do is to resect any visible lesion that you find within the Barrett segment, no matter how subtle that lesion may be. The video that I'm showing on the right really demonstrates the most uh, commonly used approach for resection, which is the multi-band mucosectomy technique. You could appreciate a visible lesion extending from the 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock position. My practice is to actually mark the lesion before I proceed with endoscopic resection. This involves sucking the lesion into a cap, deploying a band similar to endoscopic variceal band ligation, followed by resection using a hexagonal five French snare. It's really important that we resect all visible lesions during that index endoscopy. 
We then bring patients back every two to three months to achieve our ultimate goal, which is complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. And this typically involves ablation of the remaining Barrett's segment to address the risk of metachronous neoplasia, which can be as high as 30%. If this is a part of your practice, I think it's really important to be facile in the management of complications related to endoscopic therapy. These include bleeding, perforation, and strictures. And at least in 2021, once you get your patient past the finish line, which again is complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia, these patients need to be enrolled in surveillance programs so that you can address the issue of recurrences. Just a quick reminder, and again, I mean no offense to any of my pathology colleagues, our pathologists really, really struggle agreeing on a diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia and high-grade dysplasia within the Barrett segment. Now, given the datum that an expert pathology review results in a meaningful change in the diagnosis of your patient, whether it's upstaging or downstaging, our guidelines recommend that any patient with Barrett's-related neoplasia being referred for endoscopic eradication therapy should have their diagnosis confirmed by expert GI pathologists. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about the optimal management strategy for patients with dysplasia and mucosal cancer. First and foremost, I think it's important to recognize that our guidelines categorically recommend against surgery compared to endoscopic therapy for patients with Barrett's related neoplasia. Based on randomized control trials and high quality observational data, our guidelines also strongly recommend against performing surveillance for patients with high-grade dysplasia. Now let's try and tackle a challenge that we face in our practice on almost a daily basis. How do you manage patients with Barrett's-related low-grade dysplasia? This slide really just highlights the highly variable natural history that we see reported in patients with low-grade dysplasia. And most studies have looked at the endpoint of either progression to cancer or used a composite endpoint of high-grade dysplasia or cancer. I will again remind you the high inter-observer variability among our pathologists makes it extremely challenging in terms of making a decision on how to manage patients with low-grade dysplasia. I will submit to you that we have three randomized control trials that have tried to address this issue of ablation or surveillance for patients with low-grade dysplasia. However, there are several gaps in evidence and several arguments can be made against uniform ablation for all patients with low-grade dysplasia. For one, the SURF trial reported the highest rate of neoplastic progression in the surveillance arm. And quite frankly, we have not been able to replicate these results in any of our US observational studies. We also know that patients undergoing surveillance actually fare fairly well. In the SURF trial, again, there was only one patient that actually required an esophagectomy when that patient was randomized to the surveillance arm. We know endoscopic therapies actually have an adverse event rate of close to 20%. The phenomenon of regression has been well described in randomized controlled trials and observational data. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is you can't confirm the diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia on your subsequent endoscopy in up to 60% of patients diagnosed with low-grade dysplasia. None of the published studies have actually addressed important endpoints such as patient-centered outcomes, quality of life. Until date, we've not been able to identify a biomarker that allows us to identify that patient with low grade who is at the highest risk of progression to high-grade dysplasia or cancer. For folks who are really interested in diving into these management conundrums, I refer you to this clinical practice update published by the AGA. Now, 
we're going to address several of these knowledge gaps that I talked to you about for management of low-grade dysplasia in an upcoming multi-center randomized control trial that will actually randomize patients to surveillance or to ablation. And our goal is to not just look at the traditional endpoints of neoplastic progression, but also use patient-centered outcomes as one of our primary endpoints and establish a live biorepository so that we can identify a panel of biomarkers along with clinical variables that will help us identify those patients at the highest risk of progression. This study will be sponsored by the NIDDK. So until we get those results, what should you be doing in your uh, practice? So I think it's important for us to take a patient-centered approach for management of patients with low-grade dysplasia. Ablation or surveillance are perfectly viable management strategies, but patients who actually place a really high premium on avoiding adverse events related to our endoscopy therapies, surveillance is a perfectly fine treatment strategy. Now let's shift gears and quickly talk about the effectiveness and durability of our endoscopy therapies. Now outside of the SURF trial or the AIM dysplasia trial, several observational studies have demonstrated the effectiveness and safety of our EMR plus radiofrequency ablation approach to management of patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia. Anyone, again, interested in this field should pay attention to these data published by the Amsterdam group that looked at outcomes in nearly 1,500 patients who underwent endoscopic therapy, and they reported an extremely high rate of complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. But probably the biggest contribution is assessing the durability. They showed that the recurrence of Barrett's low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, or cancer is extremely low. Just using dysplasia as an endpoint, the annual risk of recurrence was 1%, and if you really care about recurrence of high-grade dysplasia or cancer, the annual risk of progression or recurrence was 0.7%. So this really just adds to the growing body of literature describing recurrence of intestinal metaplasia and Barrett's-related dysplasia in patients undergoing endoscopic therapy and adds credence to our practice of keeping these patients in surveillance programs. Another exciting study, again, from the Dutch group is really using all the variables that are typically associated with recurrence and creating a prediction model. And consistent with what John and Eco have just talked about, personalized uh, medicine is to try and come up with this model so that we can personalize surveillance endoscopies for patients who have achieved complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. This model did fairly well uh, in this preliminary analysis, but obviously needs to be externally validated. Just a word or two on alternative ablative therapies. I think the greatest body of literature is um, describing the use of cryotherapy and more recently using the cryo balloon ablation uh, system. These are being used as primary therapy in the setting of research trials, and they've shown uh, comparable response rates to radiofrequency ablation. What's my take on these newer ablative techniques? I think we definitely need more durability data, data describing recurrence rates. And finally, we need a non-inferiority randomized control trial that compares these newer ablative techniques to our standard of care, which is EMR and radiofrequency ablation. Again, you should be aware of these quality indicators that have been developed and endorsed by our GI societies. And I'll conclude by providing a few practical tips that we can all use in our practice to improve outcomes for endoscopic therapies for patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia. I strongly encourage centralized care for patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia. Treatment should occur at high volume centers centers by trained endoscopists at a center that actually provides multidisciplinary care. We should all spend adequate time and do a meticulous inspection of the Barrett segment so that we can reduce the rate of peak and pain in our clinical practice. We should have a low threshold for resecting any visible lesion within the Barrett segment. 
treatment must be conducted under adequate asset suppression, and these patients need to be enrolled in surveillance uh, programs. I think we've made a remarkable amount of progress in the field, but we obviously have a long ways to go. I tend to draw them. Uh, I'm a tennis-obsessed uh, guy. I'm a tennis-obsessed fan. We have a tennis-obsessed family, um, and I tend to draw parallels with everything that happens with tennis. Those are my twin boys on the left when they first picked up a tennis racket when they were five years old, and the picture to the right is when we played at Flushing Meadows last year, um, uh, just before the US Open. So a lot to look forward to, and I'm extremely optimistic of the future. Thank you so much. Fantastic presentations to all. So I'm going to ask uh, Mahendran uh, Jayraj to, uh, to come to the podium. And if we can have the, the first uh, case presentation, we'll try to draw out some uh, some things from uh, the from the presentations uh, good morning all um, I'm going to present a case of uh, a 66 year old uh, white male who was transferred from an outside uh, hospital for uh, vomiting hematomasis and worsening chest pain so he has a history of uh, recent balloon dilation of uh, distal esophageal stricture one week ago um, in actually uh, Texas um, following that, uh, he visited family here in Florida. He was having persistent chest pain after the procedure that progressed to uh, vomiting with every time he eats and uh, hematomesis and uh, chest pain. So uh, he has a history of uh, past medical history of asthma, eosinophilic esophagitis, and acid reflux. He has had uh, multiple dilations um, in the last uh, 12 months for dysphagia. Uh, family history is unremarkable. He has been a former smoker, occasional alcohol use. Um, currently, he's on a um, butyserine inhaler and uh, adware discus. He had uh, quit PPI recently um, for fear of side effects. Um, this was a CT on presentation. Um, on physical examination, he, he had like fever. Uh, he had a white cell count of uh, 21. Um, CT showed a perforation in the distal esophagus with a complex left pleural effusion, empyema. So, um, let me... Um, um, have the liberty of asking um, Dr. Hirano um, these questions. Is there an ideal technique to perform dilation? Is a balloon um, 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 better over a wire bougie? Or I would like to get your comments about that. Yes, uh, I don't know if my mic is. Can you turn on? Okay. Yeah, th there's no data that one dilation technique is any superior to another. Uh, there's also an over-the-scope dilator that's available now. I think it's in Europe. Um, it's, uh, so so that the, all three techniques uh, work quite effectively. I think the one thing to appreciate when you're dilating the esophagus for EOE, uh, two things. One is that uh, proximal strictures can be hard to appreciate. Uh, inlet strictures are very almost also invisible because they're overlapping with the upper esophageal sphincter. And the other time that you miss them are these long, narrow caliber esophagus in the proximal to mid esophagus where the tapering is very subtle. We're great at picking up the abrupt <laughs> change in stricture diameter of it at the EGJ. And uh, when the scope gets stuck, that's an obvious one. But the subtle ones are the ones in the proximal to mid esophagus where they're tapered. It's like an hourglass like deformity. And those can be often overlooked even by great endoscopists. Uh, so there, I th that's why I like to savory more overall. But uh, if you're going to use a balloon, what I'd encourage you to do is a technique uh, Ryan Madnick had published on UNC. Do a balloon at the EGJ where you thought you saw the stricture, and then do a pullback. Pull it back with the balloon inflated um, and see if it gets stuck somewhere. I don't like it as a dilating technique, but it picks up strictures that you might have overlooked uh, in, the, in the proximal esophagus. Um, but uh, the other thing I'll mention uh, the, uh, is the technique is, is to go start low and go slow. And that's something Joel Richter has espoused. So for dilating these patients, it's not like your tchotchke ring where you can go right to you know, 18 to 20, 20 millimeters all at once. You want to do this very thoughtfully and very gradually. I usually just take it up by a few millimeters, and I'm looking down. After I put down one, two millimeter dilation, I go look down again with the scope to see and make sure I haven't gotten disruption already, so you're doing it very cautiously. The other thing I'll mention about this case is that this is very unusual, because uh, all the reports right now of uh, perforations from dilation and EOE have not led to any surgical intervention. They've all been managed by conservative management, by hospitalization, antibiotics. I have not heard of a report reported uh, where somebody had to have a surgical intervention for perforation from EOE, and that's because usually they're micro perforations. It's just air that leaks out. It's extravasation of air, but usually not contrast and food that gets in there. So this is unusual. I think that also highlights 
It also highlights the fact that you have to go back and look. Um, I, I like balloon more than uh, Savory because I can see that tear happening and I can see it and I can assess it and see whether or not I think it's something that I have to worry about. So for me, I think, you know, always have to go back and look or do it under direct visualization where you're watching it. In terms of biomechanics, the, the EOE strictures and, and the EOE mucosa is a very different mucosa than GERD um, because it actually pops open. There's something called an open angle. And because there's so much tension in that wall from the fibrosis, it literally pops. And I jokingly say, you know, um, th there was this mantra of the rule of threes when you see the bud, you don't do more than... A rule of one for me, when I see that big pop in the open, I stop. And, and we, we've been more aggressive over the years with our dilations, but that's because we're visualizing it. And you can actually see what you're doing. And when it gets to when you have one of those nice tears that you see, then, then you stop. And I think you're pretty comfortable. But going back and looking if you're doing savory is really important. The other thing, too, just I see this in my trainees when they do savories. They shove this savory down. I, and I tell them, it's gentle. I mean, I have it loosely in my hand, and I'm gently guiding it down over the wire. But I see, you know, my fellows just like this, and you're like, you know, you're going to have some guide wire mishaps with that. And so, you yeah. know, just be careful and low and slow and, and, yeah. and gentle. Dilation yeah. is like you, gentle you, violence. Yeah. Even with the savory, you can feel <laughs> <laughs> control violence. You can, yeah, gentle violence. <laughs> um, you can feel the resistance from a savory passage. Yeah. Uh, it's not as great as a Maloney, for those of you trained with Maloney's. So Joel Richter, you guys know in Florida here, he loves to say the uh, Maloney dilators, and he's done thousands of them, and he's got a great tactile feel, so he can feel the, the resistance of the stricture. And you can feel it with a savory. It's not as good as with a Maloney. But uh, you can appreciate that. When I start to feel that, and you can feel that pop that John's talking about when you're passing the savory, you feel it, uh, feel it pop, and then I'll go look down after that as well. So. Thanks for that. Um, given the risk of um, uh, perforation and uh, perforation-related hospitalization, um, is there a patient subset where dilation should not be performed? Dr. Heron. You can uh, pull the other uh, my panelists as well, but I don't think so. I think every stricture um, is open to dilation, and these patients really do benefit from it. Um, it's, it's probably over 90% of patients that get symptom. I think the, the other 10% of people that probably weren't dilated effectively. But there are patients who, uh, this case you're presenting, where they, they have rapid rec recurrence. Uh, you dilate them up, and they close right back down. It's, it's a small, small percent, probably under 1%, that have that phenotype. But they're very hard to manage, and I've actually put in even perhaps our interventional doctors put in stents for some of the patients uh, trying to get a remodel longer. But these can be very hard to manage for the small, small subset of refractory patients. But um, I, I put the perforation rate under 1%. I don't yeah. think it's quite as high as 2 um, that the, the older data was, it was crazy. It was like even some series where they're getting 30, 40% perforations. But now with the conservative approaches that we're all using because of the early reports, I think it's under 1%. And continue medical therapy. So this, this person stopped their PPI. I mean, there's the overlapping GERD that makes this a, a more complicated disease. So continue medical therapy. I know there's some people who say you don't have to, but I think it does reduce the recurrence rate and the number of uh, dilations that you do. Dr. Wong, you have anything to say about yep. So um, we did EGD on this uh, uh, patient. Um, there was a perforation, uh, four centimeter long perforation, um, treated with a fully covered uh, um, metal stain. We put in a PEG tube for our nutrition. On day five, he was discharged home. Um, so um, is it possible uh, to predict the natural course of uh, EOE in individual patients, uh, particularly the lack of response uh, or the disease progression? Thereby, we can do some uh, um, uh, personalized treatment option. I think like Dr. Hirano touched on that. I would like to get more um, comment on that. Yeah, I don't think so right now. The only predictor we have right now for complications of disease, when the complications meaning the remodeling consequences and strictures is duration of untreated disease. The longer you have disease that's been unrecognized or untreated, the higher the likelihood. And it goes up quite dramatically where the majority of patients will have it after 10 years. Um, that, that stricture is not complications of perforation. But um, in terms of predicting which of one of your patients that has this is going to go on to a severe fibrosonic phenotype and which are not, really uh, no great data. It's all being actively looked at. That's just a, a really important unmet need right now because we don't want to put everybody on indefinite therapy. And there are patients who seem to do okay with doing minimal therapy or no therapy, but we don't have a great predictor right now. Um, so what I do right now until we have evidence and have something to do is, is I just individualize every patient on their own. So if they decide not to do therapy or even if they're on therapy, I bring them back after a year. And if they don't show any progression, and progression meaning strictures are not getting worse, then I let 
them continue what they're doing, which is sometimes doing nothing or just a minimal therapy like a PPI. Um, so I do individualize it based on their own phenotype. If they're showing me that they're going from a 15 millimeter to a 10 millimeter after a year or two, that patient should have been put on medical therapy. So I do sometimes retroactively start therapy based on individual progression. Okay, and this patient... Um yeah, sure. So this patient obviously had some fear about PPI, and he was kind of elderly too, and uh, he didn't, I think, like, uh, he didn't want uh, topical steroids on a, a long-term basis. At present, is there any um, um, impactful treatment alternatives? Yeah, I think we touched on that a bit. Um, so, so diet therapy is always, and, and I think it's something that I would be curious how many of the audience are actually using diet therapy for eosinophilic esophagitis to get a show of hands. How many of you are using elimination diets? So it's really just a small number, probably under 10% of the people here. Do, and I think it is viable. It does work. When you see it, it's amazing. Um, milk and wheat are the most common. You can start off with a lower, you don't have to do the full six food all the time. You can start with uh, one or two foods. And um, so it, it can be an alternative. And then the other one is, is the uh, biologics. They're coming online very quickly. We have phase three trial, trial data that's completed. We have two phase three trials that should be completed within the next six months. So I think there will be, will be good alternatives. Um, thanks, Dr. Hirano. Okay, I think uh, we uh, well, just one one point on that on that case. We don't know about the uh, the dilation itself, uh, but I would like to emphasize uh, I I follow uh, Iku's uh, technique uh, of dilation, which I use savory dilators, but I look after each dilation. I'm, I'm an old fart, uh, so I've been dilating for a very long time, and I'm used to dilating uh, with a sense of resistance. Uh, and I think what happened uh, in this case is, is that somebody was doing it, they didn't know they had uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, and they were dilating with a savory with expecting some resistance from a, a typical uh, reflux or fibrotic stricture, and they just kept going and, uh, and didn't get any resistance. That's the only way that I can sort of explain this kind of a perforation, but it was a, a, a full perforation. And they didn't look. And they didn't look. Uh, so I, th this was something that, I, again, I learned from Iku. Um, I, I now look. Uh, and all my complex strictures, my radiation, uh, post-radiation strictures, all these difficult strictures, uh, uh, I, I now re I re look. I, I gauge where I should start. Uh, and, then I, and then I look, and if there's no effect, then I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, I don't follow the rule of threes anymore. I follow the rule of, of what kind of um, uh, damage or, or, or whatever I'm, I'm doing. Um, so I, I think that's the take-home message for, uh, for these cases. Yeah, I would encourage you to write that case up because I, I'm not aware of any reports right now of requiring an intervention, either surgical or endoscopic intervention, uh, for a perforation from a, from a dilation. EOE. Would you have treated him with a stent? Uh, I'd have to look at that casket. I would be a little nervous about that. I thought there was actually extravasation on the initial casket, but kudos to you for managing it that way, and the patient did well. That's, yeah, uh, yeah. that's another great part of the case report. Though. Very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Better be lucky than good. Such a last word. Um, how, how long are you going to keep that stent in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we'll probably get a, a, a follow-up study, uh, see if there's any more extravasation, look at them clinically, and then remove it, it probably is, is yeah. a, a, after that. So I had a case of Barrett's, uh, and I was going to really uh, torque, uh, actually, uh, John as, as well as Sachin, um, uh, but I'm going to let them off the hook uh, unless there's an opportunity uh, later on to, to do it, because I don't want to uh, encroach too much into the... Uh, into the break. So uh, it's time for a break now.